The Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal podcast does not accept donations. In lieu of this, the Stella Burry Foundation is a registered charity established in 2005 to secure financial support for the work of Stella's Circle. Learn more and please give generously at stellaburry.ca. And now, back to the show. And welcome back to the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal podcast. My guest tonight, of course, is a returning guest. I'm very happy to have him back again. He, of course is somebody who I'm very familiar with because I actually read his two books he put out previously, Dancing on a Stamp and Dancing Forever with Spirit, here to promote his brand new book, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, Mr. Astral Projection himself, Mr. Michael Garnett, Michael Schulhauser. So happy to have you back on the show, Garnett. Thanks for returning, and I, and I think the fans are going to love this as well. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me back. I'm delighted to be here again. Man, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm really pumped to hear from you again, and the reason why, I cannot wait to hear what Albert got in store now. <laughs> now, for all those people out there who do not know, Albert is a very, very important soul, so to speak, in Garnett's life. He is a spirit guide. And uh, with this new book, I, I'm not going to give it away for my audience. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I'm very excited to hear where the heck he's taking you this time, because let me tell you, the last two books were quite a trip. Well, he didn't disappoint me this time either, Jonathan, um, and he took me on a, a whole new series of astral trips, which are in my, I describe in my third book, and so do, I met a number of very interesting people on the spirit side, I went to different planets to meet civilizations there, um, I met some fabled creatures uh, from uh, Earth's legends um, on Earth, uh, you know, one in uh, America, one in Ireland, um, and uh, so it's a very interesting set of trips, and, and Albert did this, of course, as you know, like for, the, for my second book, he wasn't there to entertain me or to satisfy my curiosity. He wanted me to see sights and talk to people that I could write about in my book so that we could all learn a lesson from what I saw or perhaps uh, receive a nugget of wisdom from Albert, who's a very wise soul. So anyway, very exciting adventures. I was happy to chronicle them in my third book, uh, which has just been released, and uh, happy to talk about it tonight here. And, you know, I feel like it's so great to have you back on the show because it truly is a continuation of your story and your own spiritual development. Uh, I kind of feel that the first books, Dancing on a Stamp, was really getting to know Albert and, and wrapping our minds around the idea that we all have spirit guide and spirit guide, some of us have, and we learned that as well. And then you had Dancing Forever with Spirit, which was kind of a continuation where you delve deeper really just deeper into you know astral projection and different things but where does dance of heavenly bliss bring us i mean in my mind it can only be a continuation really of what you've already done what's new in the land of garnet michael schulhauser well every, everything in book three is new and different from the first two books but it is a continuation really of my adventures and my contact with albert um but but in so in book three he took me on a whole new set of adventures totally different from uh from um, what I described in my second book, and it's all very interesting, and, and, uh, and you know, I was very happy to have those adventures, and very happy to write about them. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's all it's all brand new. You, you, it's not a repeat of anything in the first two, but it is in fact a continuation. It's like a sequel to the first two books. And that's that's kind of like what I figured. You know, it would really be quite pointless for Albert to take you on the same journeys again because it's all about development. You know, I can remember in my last podcast, I just totally went paranormal investigator on you i had to know why things were a certain way with albert and to me it seemed an awful lot like he chose you for a reason where did he bring you this time well um he, he took me to, our first trip this time was uh, was basically back to the spirit side where i had another meeting with the council of wise ones a very brief meeting and the council of wise ones as i mentioned in my show with you last year is a, a committee of sort of very wise and advanced souls whose job it is to oversee all the incarnations on our planet. And so there I got a short message from the chair of that uh, council, Sophia, who said that, like she had told me before, and, and, and I described in my second book, she said, you know, uh, the council's not very happy with the progress that humans are making in terms of discarding their negative emotions um, and, and embracing love and compassion. And, and because too many humans let their negative emotions like fear, anger, hate, and greed rule too much of their lives, that results in a lot of violence and conflict on our planet, and it, it, it causes problems for Mother Earth, and it causes problems for the other animals who share our planet. So it was really sort of a, uh, a, an admonishment that I needed to sort of 
get at spreading the message that they had given to me before uh, and, and try to make sure that more and more humans heard the message and try to change their ways to try to climb out of the pit of darkness into, and see the light about where they should be going in terms of uh, their planet and the other creatures on our planet. So it was sort of a short message from them. And then uh, the next stop was to, uh, we left the spirit side and Albert took me to um, an aquarium in California. And there I had a conversation with an orca, a killer whale. Oh, oh i got to stop you right there, Garnett, because my wife, her absolute favorite animal on the planet is orcas. She loves orcas. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the documentary Blackfish before, but uh, uh, this, uh, this documentary was actually about Tilikum, the killer whale that's in captivity. And uh, let me tell you, it, it wasn't a very happy story. I got a feeling this orca whale probably never had a whole lot of positive things to tell you, did he? No, it was, it was actually a female. Her name was Yolanda. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't seen that, that documentary, but I've heard about it. But anyway, yeah, her story was probably not much different. She was basically, she said to me, you know, look at, uh, you know, whales, we're uh, intelligent, sensitive, emotional creatures. Um, we communicate with each other by telepathy. And all we want to do is just live in peace and harmony with our planet and all the other creatures, including humans. And she said that they were very dismayed at the, at the treatment that they have been receiving, whales and dolphins and a lot of other creatures, at the hands of humans over the last few centuries. You know, when, you know, whales have been... Uh, hunted and killed uh, by whaling ships, uh, you know, they, they get snarled in our traps and nets, um, they get imprisoned in water parks, um, and uh, uh, they get poisoned by the pollution we dump into our oceans. And so it's, it's been a very sort of abusive relationship. They don't understand why we do it. They just want to live in, in peace and harmony with us, as I said. And she really had a, a sad tale. She said, you know, she was born in the Pacific, to freely roaming in the Pacific, until she was, it was is wonderful because that's what they're designed to do, to, to roam free, freely in the oceans. And then she was caught by humans, put in this uh, concrete prison, and forced to perform silly tricks for a bunch of spectators who didn't seem to care about her plight. And so she was very upset at that. She, all she wanted was to be free, go back into the ocean, where she can frolic in the blue waters of the Pacific, where she came from, and she really wanted me to take her message back to my fellow humans through my book to, to, to implore them to set her and all the other workers free and stop abusing them, you know? So it was really a, a sort of a sad tale of woe from this beautiful creature who was very sensitive and compassionate, um, and uh, I really wanted to do my best to try to take her message, uh, you know, back to, to my uh, fellow humans, and hopefully something good can be done. And I, and I heard, coincidentally, I, in the news recently, I think that there was some mention of a water park in California where they were going to change the way they were dealing with orcas. I don't know if you heard that or not, Jonathan. Yes, I did, actually. It was actually a global news because as of, I believe, the end of this summer, um, they'll no longer be breeding whales in captivity. That's what that news actually was. And uh, that, of course, has spawned from SeaWorld, really, and, and a lot of other places around the world that do hold these large mammals Really, these just gigantic blackfish, they, they keep them in, in small enclosures, and it's just not healthy. So they've decided that they'll no longer be raising them in captivity. Um, whether or not they'll be keeping them actually at the water parks, I, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it sounds like they haven't taken the final step of just saying, we're going to release all of our captive orcas into the ocean. Uh, maybe they'll get there at some point, but then it's a good first step, though in not having you know new babies born in captivity where they spent their whole life in a concrete prison you know and so that's a very positive step so anyway that was one of the stops that albert did, first stops that he took to me uh, to see um and, and then he, he also showed me a number of other scenes of uh of how humans abuse animals on our planet uh i don't want to get into it in detail because we don't have much time in the show but it's all detailed in my book but then to my surprise one of the biggest surprises was that he took me to a cavern underneath the North Pole, Jonathan, hmm. where I actually had a conversation with the consciousness of Mother Earth. Her name is Gaia. Ah, Gaia and, and herself. So, surprisingly, a lot of people have, have surmised that uh, our planet has, a, has its own consciousness. I found out for sure that, yes, it does. A very uh, kind, intelligent uh, consciousness of, you know, a lady uh, who uh, who is basically the sum total of everything on our planet, all the rivers and oceans and mountains and rocks and deserts, uh, that's all her. And she's fiercely protective of all of her flora and fauna. And she wants to protect uh, her environment to make sure that they can thrive as they always have thrived. And she was very concerned about how humans have now in intervened sort of into the whole mix. And, and over the last while, they've really stepped up their pollution of Mother Earth. And they've also stepped up, you know, the the abuse of, uh, of, of the other animals on our planet. She was very distressed at this, and she really wanted me to, again, take the message 
back to my fellow humans to say, you guys got to stop abusing the animals and you have to stop the pollution of the place you live because otherwise it's going to turn out very badly for you. And so she was really saying, you know, um, you know, you, you made a lot of progress in the last few years in curtailing your, your, um, your pollution, but you need to do better than that. And she said, and here's a big surprise. She said, you know, um, I, I have a way of fighting back. She says, I can actually, if I choose, increase the intensity and frequency of natural disasters on the planet, like earthquakes, hurricanes, volcanoes, droughts, floods. Um, and, and she said she has been doing a bit of that lately because she wants to shoot a, a, a shot across our bow to, to wake us up and make us realize that if we don't change our ways, um, things go very bad for this planet. And she doesn't want that to happen. She doesn't. She's not vindictive. Doesn't uh, dislike humans. She just wished we weren't so abusive and so invasive in terms of being the dominant species on the planet. And, and she, you know, she recalled the good old days back when you know we lived in the Stone Age. She said humans were fine. They didn't cause any pollution. They didn't cause any major disruptions to the other uh, wildlife, and uh, things went along rosily uh, uh, until, of course, we had the industrial revolution, and we rapidly developed a lot of uh, advanced technology which gives us even greater power to affect our environment and to affect the animals on the planet so she's really hoping that we can sort of uh, change our ways before we uh, before it was too late yeah uh, you know right away I got to ask more questions about a running in really would you consider her a spirit uh, well she's yeah she is she's a, she's a spirit she's the constant consciousness of mother earth so she's a spirit, not quite the same way that you and I are, but she's she's got a consciousness. She's uh, she, she's got a, um, a she ex exists beyond the, uh, the 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 physical molecules of the planet, but she's very much of a part of it. So I didn't get into details of exactly how she fit into the whole scheme of things, but she's clearly a spirit. She's a, a, a you know an entity of energy that happens to be the the one that sort of surrounds our planet tries to look after the, the well-being of our of our earth and so that's that's who she is so interesting you know one of my favorite parts in your past books because i did read both of them by the way because you sent them to me so kindly <laughs> i uh one of the things i really loved uh, was when you were talking about the akashic records now i don't know if you get into that at all in your uh, new book but uh, this idea where all the knowledge of our history is stored um did you get a chance to go back there just out of curiosity this time Yes, I did. Yeah, I did go back to the Akashic Records. Um, and, and one of the things he showed me there was actually very interesting because um, I had, uh, like in my second book, I had described uh, where he gave me a brief preview of my life review where he showed me a few segments of my current life, to, you know, where there were some lessons that I should have learned or I would learn now by watching them. Um, and I saw, you know, uh, a few scenes from the life of Jesus and some other people in the Akashic Records. That's in my second book. In my third book, he took me back to the Akashic Records because I had said to him, you know, have, have humans um, on this planet always been so mired in negative emotions like our current civilization? And he said, no, there have been other human civilizations that don't exist anymore uh, that have lived in peace and harmony with their environment and with each other. And so he took me to the Akashic Records to show me, this, this you'll find interesting, Jonathan. Yeah. He showed me a human civilization that lived among the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Weird, because that doesn't line up at now, all. The archaeologists, of course, tell us that, that there weren't any humans around back then because they haven't discovered any remains. But he showed me that there actually was one. It was a, uh, a small civilization lived in a walled city. And this was in Central America. And they had a, a very sort of a simple life close to nature. They had no technology. Um, but they, uh, they lived in a very... Uh, sort of equal society where men and women were equal in every respect, where they shared the the, the, the child rearing and the cleaning and cooking and hunting duties. Um, and they, they lived very close to nature, didn't pollute the planet, um, and they respected the wildlife. They killed only what they needed to eat and for, you know, skins for clothing, and there was no waste. And so they're very respectful of, of their surroundings, very respectful of each other. They understand that they were connected to the source and to each other. And so they uh, had no crime or violence. So it was a very uh, idyllic sort of society. And I actually saw, I'm watching on the, you know, the Akashic Records, they have these big holographic globes where, where Albert will zero in on the various scenes he wants me to see. So I saw one hunting party expedition, uh, expedition from this uh, civilization where they went uh, creeping through the t 
tall grass and ended up uh, hunting and killing a hadrosaurus with their spears, <laughs> which they quickly cut into chunks and then placed on poles and scurried back to their walled city. And they got there just before a T-Rex that was on uh, on the hunt uh, caught up with them. And uh, they got behind their high walls and the T-Rex had to go away and find something else to eat. So it was very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, this civilization um, didn't survive, not through any fault of their own, because um, shortly after I saw the scene that I did, uh, Albert told me that an asteroid uh, crashed into the Yucatan Peninsula um, and it uh, kicked up a bunch of volcanoes all over the world, which spewed smoke and dust. Um, and it ended up with a, the, our planet basically had a nuclear winter for a couple of three years. That ended up destroying most of the dinosaurs. Um, and this civilization, this uh this, this community, their little city, walled city, was buried under several hundred meters of lava. That's why nobody's been able to find it. Hmm. But he said there it was, and it was a nice civilization. He said he wished that they had continued on, because maybe today um, our civilization would be much different if we had sort of followed on their footsteps, but they were sort of completely wiped out. And then sometime later, he said, uh, the ET seated another group of humans uh, later in, in the uh, in, in this, in, you know, in, in the uh, uh, e or several eons later, they they uh, seeded humans again um, because the first one was just totally destroyed. So, so that uh, so we are not direct descendants from that civilization because they were all destroyed, but we are descendants from uh, newly seeded humans that the ETs brought along uh, much later. So, tell me a little tiny bit about these ETs who've seeded us. You know, you, you've, you've mentioned that before on my podcast. We didn't get a whole lot into it last time because I was more interested really in learning about Albert. Um, but now I'm more interested in about the information, and I just got to know. Tell me a little tiny bit about uh, what you know about the extraterrestrial influence here on this planet. Uh, from what I gather, what you talk a, lot, talk a lot about in your book is that they've seeded us. They don't necessarily interfere too much. But they basically seated us and they kind of watch over us and check back every now and then. Which would explain actually a lot of abductions as well as, uh, you know, just really sightings of UFOs. Uh, tell us a little tiny bit about the, the extraterrestrial influence on our planet. Yeah, Albert says that there's been a number of very advanced races, not just one, but, but you know, dozens of them, who have been visiting Earth right since the beginning of time. Um, and they, they, they come and they go and they watch and then they come back. Um, and they were instrumental in seeding humans on, on the planet. And Albert says they've had to do this a couple of times because uh, a number of our civilizations uh, you know, have just uh, totally perished, and so they have to sort of restart the experiment. And they come from various uh, uh, planets in our galaxy. Uh, th they're basically directed uh, in terms of the seeding of life on, on Earth um, by a, a, a committee sort of a, a federation called the, the, the Galactic Council, Federation of sort of all the advanced ET races in the in the galaxy, and uh, once the, the the Galactic Council finds a planet that's uh, you know suitable to harbor life, then they will organize uh, some of these ET races that have warp drive and faster than light travel uh, to to bring uh, life from one planet to Earth to, to sort of get it going. So they seeded uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the animal and plant life on Earth, and they've seeded humans as well. And they are, you're right, as, a, as I mentioned in my second book, they sort of plant the life here and then they're sort of uh, directed to sort of let things play out as they will, even though sometimes it turns out badly. And so they've had to watch um, when, the, when a, some of the previous human civilizations that, that we're aware of, like Lemuria and Atlantis, where they've risen up to great heights and then just destroyed themselves, they crashed and burned. And these um, ETs were not able to, uh, because of their terms of reference, weren't able to step in and interfere. So they have to sort of, they give us guidance whenever they can. They try to help us in a technological sense, but they can't just sort of directly step in and say, okay, humans, we're going we're gonna to stop all your violence. We're going to stop all your wars. We're going to destroy all of your weapons. They'd like to do that, but they're not allowed to do that. And so they have to sort of let it play out. And that's why we've had so many wars and so much violence. And we still do today. And, and uh, they're watching us as we're getting to a point that's very close to where Atlantis and Lemuria were before they crashed and burned, and they're hoping we don't do the same, but they can sort of get in and fix everything for us. So it's been a very interesting relationship. Albert says that the, uh, the pace of observations by the ETs has really picked up since humans split the atom in World War II. Um, and, and that sort of indicates to them, like, oh, these humans are really have made a major step in the... Uh, 
technological ladder and we need to sort of pay more attention to them. But again, they are not allowed to just step in and destroy over nuclear weapons, which would be a good idea, but they can't do that. So, uh, they, yeah, they've been watching us, they've been helping us, and they've been seeding life. And so they're very benevolent. There are no bad ETs that come to our planet. Uh, they're all good. They have all good intentions, and they really want us to win this battle. And um, you know, they're they're observing us and they're cheering us on. They've decided that it's not appropriate at this time yet to make open, direct contact with humans. But Albert says that in the future, and he wouldn't say when, in the future they will have open contact with us. It seems like we got to get to a certain extent or a certain point before they'll kind of interject. You know, one thing that really fascinates me about that whole idea, the idea that we were seated was that, my God, there must be millions, and I mean millions of other planets out there where these ETs maybe have do, doing, maybe doing the same thing they've done here. So that's a really cool idea, that the idea that we're not alone in the universe. Um, you know, you talked before in your previous books about astral projection, and uh, I, I will, of course, want to elaborate with you a little bit about that first before I ask some heavier questions about that process. But can you tell me what it's actually like, Garnett? What, what's the feeling you get when you actually do this astral projection? You know, to me, it's so it's so foreign and so out there because I, I, I don't even remember my dreams, to be honest with you. I can't imagine what it must be like to go and explore. What's the feeling when you take Albert's hand and you go? What is that feeling like? Well, it just... Once my astral body is out uh, of my physical body, it just feels like I have like basically uh, no weight, like there's nothing, that there's no matter. Uh, I'm not composed of matter anymore. I'm so, it just feels like I'm a body of energy, and I have, I have no, uh, you know, no weight, um, and I can just pass through walls and ceilings and uh, you know hard objects just like they weren't even there. It's a very different feeling, obviously, because we, I, I spent all my life in a physical body where if you bump into a wall, you, you can hurt yourself, you know. As, as an astral traveler, nothing like that uh, gets in the way. You can just, uh, you know, you can just, you're basically like you're floating. And the other thing that's interesting is that you can move from one place to another almost instantaneously. And I, I, I didn't know how to do this, how to maneuver myself, but Albert was there with me, and he would just sort of say, okay, you want to go here, and just sort of like snap your fingers, and there you are. So it's, it's almost like instantaneous travel. You travel through the power of thought. Hmm. So you can get anywhere really rapidly, you know, very quickly, and so it, it, it was, uh, you know, quite an amazing experience. And uh, of course, when I'm in astral form and Albert's showing me things on our planet, um, the people in physical form can't see me or Albert. Uh, they just can't see us, and so we can sort of, you know, hang around and we can watch what's happening on Earth. Um, and the, the other, the, the people there don't even aren't even aware that we're there. And so it's very much of a, a you know, you can sort of a sneak, have a sneak peek on what's happening in other people's lives without them being aware that you're watching them. So it's kind of an interesting uh, way to travel. And, uh, uh, you know, and on the spirit side, everyone there is is in their natural form, is a, is a being of energy. So no one there has anything physical about them. And, and there's no need to eat, drink, breathe, or do any of those things. And, uh, and, and they are just basically uh, like I was in astral form. Uh, and that's sort of the, that's sort of the natural... Uh, existence for all souls is to be beings of energy and so with my astral travels I got to have a temporary um, feeling of what that is like but then every uh, after every trip uh, Albert would bring me back to my home and I would slip back into my physical body and then I'd wake up and guess what I'm guarded in the, the human again in physical form so it, it was really uh, just a, really quite a contrast between the two Absolutely. And, you know, as you're telling me this, all I can think about is Dickens. I can think about Ebenezer Scrooge being taken by his ghosts of his past to look back on his old life. And I think about that, and it leads me to a very interesting question that I don't think anybody's ever asked you before in any of the podcasts I've heard you on, Garnett. Are you the only one? Are you the only man in history who's had this wonderful spirit guide take you on these adventures and shown you these things? It seems to me like it's a constructive idea the idea that you are having these guides take you places so that you can relay the messages whether it's in your book or even on these podcasts are you the only one garnet that i don't know i um, i asked Elbert if there were other people and he, he he declined to comment but i suspect that um there have been other people who've been astral traveling and maybe not quite in the same fashion that i have but um i mean the bottom line is is that Jonathan, every one of us 
Astro travels at night when we sleep, except we're not usually allowed to remember those trips. So we all do it. And some people sort of remember bits and pieces and they think it's a dream. Uh, other people are, uh, you know, have more cogent uh, memories of their astral trips. Uh, you know, there's been other guys like, uh, you know, the uh, Robert Monroe wrote several books and he developed a technique to, to, to astral travel on his own. And he just developed this over a period of years and he's gone to very many interesting places. He's dead now, but he wrote some books on this. And so that's that's one example of where, where, where somebody has done it. Uh, and I expect there's other people who've also done it, probably many people who do it and don't really want to admit that they have because they might feel that other people will think they're losing their mind or going crazy. You know, so it's, uh, it, it, I, I'm pretty sure there's other people who do it. Uh, Albert just didn't want to get into it, but I know that he has a lot of knowledge about that and someday he'll probably tell me. But anyway, I, I don't think I'm unique. I think other people have done it. Yeah, and it kind of lends to this idea, you know, as an EVP researcher, I know my thing is investigating the paranormal and searching for the voices of what I may believe, what I'm led to believe, are coming from another dimension of space that we're not aware of. You know, this whole idea that when we pass away, our spirit can be trapped in a building or even stuck here on this plane. Did Albert give you any kind of indication? You know, as as just for the whole ghost hunting people out there who like listening to my podcast. Okay, is there anything he passed on? about uh, your spirit when you pass on. Is there anything, any information you can relay there at all as to what might be going on? Well, in terms of ghosts, it's very interesting because there was a, there's a chapter in my third book about my visitation with a spirit, which some people would have called a ghost. And, and it, it rose because I was watching a paranormal uh, a TV broadcast where there was ghost hunters trying to track down a ghost in a haunted house. And so I asked Albert about that. And he said, oh, well, come on, I'll show you. So we actually went to this very same house in England, this mansion, uh, where the ghost hunters had been uh, trying to detect the spirit. And there, because I'm in astral form, of course, I can see the, the spirit of the, of the ghost of this person who was uh, haunting this house. And, and she was a lady who had, uh, who had died violently. Uh, she, she and her husband and children had lived in that house. And she had surprised a burglar one night when her husband was away. And the burglar had stabbed her to death, violent, brutal death. And her spirit... Uh, was so upset that she didn't quite realize that her physical body had had passed on and she didn't want to believe that she was dead. She wanted to hang around to make sure she could look after her children. And so she was in a confused state for a while and she hung around the house and she ignored her spirit guides who had come to sort of take her by the hand and take her back to the spirit side. She refused to sort of acknowledge them for a period and she would do things uh, like, uh, you know, open and close doors and bang cupboard doors and turn lights on off and on and she was doing that to try to scare away the people who had purchased uh, her house after she and her kids had uh, you know had, had moved out or she had passed away and she was trying to scare them away with the view that perhaps then her children could go back to live with her in the house so she was just a confused spirit who hadn't quite realized the reality of the fact that she had physically died and she needed to move on to the spirit side and so as I watched um, her guides finally moved in and sort of smothered her in uh, gentle hugs of love and basically convinced her that she was a spirit. Her physical body had died. She needed to move on to the, to the spirit side and get on with her with her evolution as a soul. And they actually sort of escorted her out of the house and back to the spirit side. So Albert says that is often what happens uh, when, when uh, you know people say there's ghosts or the houses are haunted. It's probably because there's a confused spirit who's hanging around and, and isn't quite ready to cross over to the spirit side, but no one has ever left there forever. You're never trapped uh, on this plane. You're never trapped in a house because your guides are always there to eventually take you by the hand and, and lead you to safety. Um, and, uh, you know, but, you know, like a house could be haunted for 200 years by the same spirit because 200 years of the spirit side is just a blink of an eye. They don't have linear time. So um, he said that's, that happens often uh, when you have a, you hear about a, a house that's, that's haunted, or people see a, a ghostly apparition, um, and that's just probably what it is. It was very interesting. Yeah, that is really interesting because you know that's what I'm into. That's that's my cup of tea, so to speak. And uh, it's interesting to hear that you know they they <laughs> even on the other side where you think that this may be completely different, they're given the same explanations that we have on Earth. <laughs> Speaking of uh, paranormal, shall we say? Uh, 
superstars. You know, I think a ghost is like a paranormal superstar. You mentioned that you actually ran into two, uh, what was the word? I think you believe, I believe you used the word legendary creatures. Faithful creatures, yes. Yeah, tell me a little tiny bit about that, Garnett, because as soon as you said Ireland, you know, the first thing that popped in my mind was, oh boy, oh boy, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Did you run into well, a leprechaun? In, in Ireland, I actually got to meet one of the Emerald Isle's fabled uh, little people. She was a fairy. Oh. A little fairy. And Albert took me to a secluded meadow in uh, Ireland, and all, all of a sudden he went behind a, a, a clump of bushes, and out he came holding the hand of this beautiful little fairy. She was about three feet tall. She looked like a tiny, perfect china doll, just exquisite. And her name was Brina, and, she, and we communicated by telepathy. She said that... Um, you know, fairies are very, very real. The little people of Ireland are very real. She says that they have to hide underground now uh, because of humans, because the humans above ground are violent and aggressive and they want to avoid us. And she said that before humans arrived on in, on that island, the fairies were able to roam freely above ground and frolic in the sunlight. But when, when humans came and, and they realized how violent and aggressive we were, they were forced to hide in underground cities, which is where they have been to date. They come out uh, at night once in a while. Sometimes they're spotted by humans, but only rarely. And she lamented the fact that, you know, they really wanted to come back out on the surface again, but they wouldn't dare do so as long as humans uh, were in their, their current state of affairs. And she said, if humans could ever see the light and discard their violence, uh, then they would, uh, the fairies would hope they would be able to live in peaceful coexistence with them once again. So very interesting, you know, it just goes to show you that when there's a, uh, legends that have been passed down uh, you know from, uh, from father to son and mother to daughter over the centuries there's usually some truth uh, to those legends they just they weren't made up out of uh, you know out of the, out of the blue sky there's usually something to them some substance and so she was a good example of yeah here we are we we live on this planet we have to stay in hiding because we're afraid of humans so it was really an unfortunate story on her part and hopefully someday they will be able to come out of the surface and frolic in the sunlight once again hmm and i gotta ask who's the second what was the second creature or legendary animal you ran into because uh boy i tell you i did not expect you to say fairy that must have been in ireland right am i right in saying that yes it was ireland yes nice it was ireland. okay i, yeah, I gotta it was, it was fairy in ireland. okay the, the other legendary fable creature was a sasquatch oh this is gonna be great because you know what <laughs> i've had so many questions about this guy because in my mind, we should have caught him by now. <laughs> so, well, let me tell you, it was in a, Albert took me, it was in a forest in the Pacific Northwest of the, of the U.S. Yep. And there I was introduced to a Sasquatch, and, and again, it was a female. Her name was Zana, and she was about nine feet tall. She had sort of kind of like an ape-like head, and her muscular body was covered in dark brown hair. And again, we communicated by telepathy. She was a very intelligent, sensitive creature, and she says that, again, like the fairies, uh, the Sasquatch has been in hiding for the, for the longest time because they are afraid of humans. They view us as violent and aggressive and that we're just basically bad news and they don't want to have any contact with us, which is why they haven't been caught or openly exposed. And they live in underground cities and they come out usually only at night. But the, the key thing for them to help avoid detection is that she said they have what she calls sort of like an animal sensitive radar and that allows them to detect humans from many miles away, long before humans are even in eyesight. And, and she says this allows them, has allows them to, uh, you know, hide when humans are around. And of course, they populate the remote forests of the world. She says they live in uh, all the continents except Antarctica. You know, so they they're also known as you know, Yeti and Bigfoot and Bob and Snowman and you know all those names. But they're basically. It's all the same creature, just living in remote parts of the world, um, and again, so they can avoid contact with humans. And she said that she, uh, th th their species originated in Africa many centuries ago uh, as a result of the uh, uh, of a, a now extinct primate that lived on Earth, was inseminated with the sperm from a, a race of humanoid extraterrestrials, and that resulted in their species, which has been carried on since then. And so she's saying, you know, like the fairy, she's saying. I wish humans would clean up their act, stop being so aggressive and abusive, so that we can come out from hiding and live together in uh, in harmony. And that's all they want. But uh, in the meantime, they don't want to they don't want to have anything to do with us because we're just bad news. Wow. So so far, this podcast has touched on just about everything paranormal. It really is a paranormal potpourri here tonight. 
on the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast. But Garnet, you know, I always got to ask the tough questions too. And, and I can imagine that by now, I'm sure you've run into a hundred people who love what you do, but you run into a lot of hard-nosed skeptical people as well. What do you say to people who are skeptical of your story? Well, all I can say is is that there's no way I can prove that I spoke to, that I speak to my spirit guide. I can no way I can prove that I have one. I can't prove that I've been astral traveling, not in any scientific sense, not 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 by any methods that's recognized by the scientific community. And I said, but most of the other people who have these experiences, you know, the people who have NDEs, you know, like. Uh, um, the doctor who wrote uh, Proof of Heaven and the little boy who was the subject of that book called uh, Heaven is for Real and all the other uh, books written about NDEs. There's been tons of them. None of those people can prove that they actually left their body and went over to the spirit side and then came back again. Uh, uh, so I'm not concerned about the skeptics. I can say, I say to them, you can believe whatever you want to believe. But at the end of the day, when we're both dead, we will both know who was telling the truth. <laughs> and if you want to believe what you want to believe right now, then go ahead. That's your right. <laughs> yeah, that is a really interesting take on it. You know, uh, and, and I ask that because, as you know, I'm into the paranormal. I get that question a lot. And uh, I'm probably going to get it a lot this weekend coming up at Sci-Fi and the Rock number 10. <laughs> so I'll be getting that a lot as well. You know, Garnett, I, I know our time is starting to draw very close to an end. But i got to ask, you know, is there any message you'd like to relay on the people out there right now who listen to this podcast, fans of my podcast, who've been listening for years? I know they're excited to have you back, and they know this is a continuation. First and foremost, I'm sure you want these people to pick up your book. This is important. we got to get that out there. Garnett, where can people find your latest book? Well, well the best source of information is on my website, Jonathan which is garnetschulhalser.com. That's hard to remember, but if the people Google dancing on a stamp, they can get to my website. And there there are buy links uh, on my site to all the popular online stores like Amazon and Chapters Indigo and Barnes and & Noble and all the other ones. And so if you just click on any of those uh, logos, you'll get right to the place where you can buy it. There's a lot of bricks and mortar stores that have my books. Um, it's sort of hit and miss, depends on what the managers want to order. Uh, but if your favorite bricks and mortar store doesn't have them, they can certainly order them for you. So I encourage everyone to, you know, to read about my adventures with Albert. Uh, you know, the, the you mentioned the first two books. The third one is just uh, just coming out, and so it's uh, it's now available. And uh, I, you know, I've had a lot of compliments about my books. I encourage your listeners to read them, and if they have any questions or if they have any comments, my email address is on my website, and I'd be happy to hear from them. Garnet, do you have any passing message to relay on to the other people out there who are listening to this podcast right now? Straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, which would probably be Albert's <laughs> in your case. Well, you know, it, it, you know uh, Albert has told me quite often, he said, you know, you're on a, a spiritual journey in a human body, okay? You're a spirit having a human journey. And he says, you know, you need to lighten up and not take life so seriously. Because you're on an adventure here that you chose for yourself before you were born and so no matter what happens to you no matter how many mistakes you make no matter how many wrong turns you make you you can't go wrong and become lost you will always end up back on the spirit side no matter what you do here back to the place you came from back to your true home and, and, and so he said you should just smile at everyone you meet laugh a lot and and, and recognize that you're always going to end up back in a beautiful place and so Enjoy your adventure. <laughs> to every day is an adventure, at Garnet. I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast again, my friend. And uh, I can't wait for book number four to come out. I don't. I'm, I'm let alone book number three, because <laughs> then I get well, to have my good friend Garnet Schulhauser back again. Yeah, and if you'd like to, if you'd like to review a review copy of book three, Jonathan, just send me an email with your address, and I'll have my publisher send you one. <laughs> and in you... terms of book, in terms of book four, uh, book four is about seventy five percent of the way through. It's a sequel to the first three with more adventures with Albert. So I don't know when that's coming out. It depends on when I finish it, but it's in progress. The last two books you gave me, I actually I read them both. And uh, my highest compliment I can give you is that I passed them on to my mother-in-law as soon as I was finished reading them because I know she loves angels and those kinds of stories. So there you have it, folks. If you're into astral projection, if you're into just knowing things about the paranormal, a different view, a view from an astral projector, Mr. Garnet Schulhauser, thanks again for being on The Odd Newfoundland. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. I look forward to the next show. 
Well, the time to say goodbye is upon us. But don't worry, you can keep track of the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast very easily. It's available on Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, and TuneIn Radio. Just look for the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast banner. Of course, if you'd like to keep up to date, you can always check out the Odd the Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast Facebook page, drop a like, and every single time a new show goes up, you'll be notified. You can also follow me, John Mallard, on Twitter, at O-D-D-T-O-N-F-L-D. That's odd to Newfoundland. Get your latest news on the podcast as well as the ever-popular para-joke of the day. From the oldest city in North America, I bid you adieu. From the Odd to Newfoundland Paranormal Podcast.